feedback. Good morning. <laughs> it worked this afternoon. Now, okay. This is morning. It is afternoon. All right. In so California. Pass that back and forth. Yeah, I was just going to say, let's set this here and hope the phone switch does not eat it. Mm. Um, it is what, what, who wants to start? Introductions, whatnot. Okay, well, technically, oh. my name's on the panel. So yeah. All right, anyway, this is the. Uh, what did I call it? The, the, the telco, telco data US, dot US panel. Uh, I don't think my name the, that was part of it, but it the was the US didn't go in the, in the telco the data talk panel. It's something, something like that. that. Anyway, the whole intention of this, I don't know how it was billed or how many you know, but the point is to take questions and answers on telecommunications, um, all the stuff you want to know but don't um, <laughs> know where to ask. Um, that which we know better than to ask. Right. Exactly. <laughs> if you want to ask something you know better than to, if you think other people in the room don't know the answer and you think they'd benefit, well, why not? Um, if you ask something stupid, we'll give you a stupid answer. Oh, boy. I didn't know that was <laughs> on the table. Might as well be. Um, anyway, we're going to start off. This is uh, Joe and myself. Or Nate. Or Nate. Or Nate. Oh. Yeah. If, we're, if we're all going first names. If we're all going okay. first names. Um, he does telco stuff. <laughs> he <laughs> does sysadmin, telephone, whatever. Uh, basically, stuff. communications, LAN, WAN, um, thrashing of telcos, that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, and, and can I? I'd like to. Come in. All right. I'd like to Im issue a, a preemptive screw you to all the people in advertising who now call their field communications because they're afraid to call it advertising. No, communications you pick up and you dial. Advertising you look at and you say, God, I wish they hadn't cut those trees down. All right. <laughs> they're overloading my word and I'm pissed about it. Anyway, uh, where do we want to start? We should probably start by explaining uh, explaining Clicky because uh, I've Somebody probably should. explained it about 200 times already. Um, first thing everyone needs to know is Clicky is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch it. Yes. People kept coming up like, oh, no, maybe I shouldn't. Everybody's <laughs> looking at me like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, after after watching you get after watching you get knocked on your ass that first time, it was. Uh, it was pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's trying to demonstrate it at the beginning of the week, and this is just even what talk battery will do to you. Um, and even on a supposedly dead phone line, they will leave battery on. This thing kicks out what? Somewhere between 48 and 96, depending on what mood it's in? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's battery. You know, that's, that's just, it's hanging out. It's not even ringing. So he's hitting there, pulse dialing, just by hitting two wires together. And the next thing we know, he's kind of falling backwards away from the phone switch. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's kind of falling important very quickly safety backwards. Tips. Yeah. Um, don't hold it so close to the end of the insulation that your fingers can slip onto the wire. Mm -hmm. um, but what it is is a stepping phone switch. And, or, well, yeah. that's being generous. It's an intercom. Yeah, it's, it's a very small phone switch. For, for an itty bitty village, it would work. Yes. <laughs> it, it does not connect to other switches. It doesn't have a trunk port, meaning that it, it could function as a phone switch if you didn't care about connecting to anything else. Um, Can you fire it up and step a few relays? Um, that depends on whether we have power. Uh, yeah, there's power right here. I okay. Uh, the, the, the next question is, is, are we going to kill something if we plug it in? I don't think it draws that much. No. Famous last <laughs> words. <laughs> well, at least not when it's not intentionally trying to knock somebody away from it. It clicked. It, it, it clicked. Yes. Okay, so it is, it is at least, I'm, I can hear the caps uh, bouncing, so yeah. <laughs> bouncing. Well, they're, they're... Do you have a modem in your computer? Um, it's got a phone jack. I don't think out. I have, I don't think I have drivers for it. It's a wind modem. And I run Windows, Hiss, so. hiss. Windows um, XP comes with wind modem drivers. Well, oh, see. hey, well, look, we got another microphone. No, this is just for the video. Uh, soft smoke, so. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> if you don't, we can I probably... I carry a large stick, so that's okay. If it's the fact, it wasn't for the fact that the coke hot got destroyed. Um, yes, it's in pieces. It's in pieces. Don't ask. <laughs> Actually, isn't that a Rubicon relic? Yes. Okay. Uh, no more. I was making a hacker's reference. Yes, this is a payphone. Don't ask. Okay. <laughs> um... So while Nate's doing that... No, no drivers. No drivers. Just take your Bummer. micro cassette recorder, insert five dollars and quarters, and never again pay for a service that could be free if it weren't run by a bunch of profiteering gluttons. 
<laughs> All right, so All right. Do I do actually just want to, because we don't really didn't get this thing ready for demo. No. All right, I'm going to unplug it just for safety's sake. Yeah, I was about to say before we. It is fired up. Um, <laughs> it's ready to rock. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, how it works is, is that there is a line finder relay and a, uh, it's a, then the selector. And what happens is when you pick up, a, pick up the phone, oh, I'm what? Yeah, the video. This is video. Sort of broken, but <laughs> okay. There's a line finder relay, and when you pick up the phone, it just knows someone picked up the phone. The job of the line finder relay is to find the line that just picked up. When it does, it then patches it in here, and it does some stuff with the relays. Um, we'll just pretend this is like the magic, magic happens here sort of section because um, holy crap. I don't know. Um, oh, this is this is all the mechanical. then it goes in this this routes two calls at once. Uh, there's two finders and two selectors, and what happens is this absorbs your pulse digits. So you'll be like dial three. When it terminates, it then uses this relay to uh, there's it's constantly clicking when there's a line off hook, and it times the ringing cycle. And it's actually putting out ringing voltage. It's the ring generator relay. And the destination port gets put into the ring generator relay, where it starts sending something. How much do you know? It should be. It's US standard is 90 volts. But I yeah, don't know approximately 90 volts at 20 hertz. We know it won't fry a modem. Yeah, we haven't cooked any modems yet. Uh, but uh, it definitely rings pretty much anything we've thrown on the line, including mechanical ringers. This is pretty much a subset of what every single phone switch in the United States up until about, what, the 60s? Mm -hmm. And even on through the early 80s did, except you had oh, selectors that were, well, two axis selectors that were doing pretty much the same thing. Yeah, your voice is going on the video, so you need to, one no, of those talk, talk at him. Be, yeah, or stand closer to him. Okay. Um, this is all, these things are still common. Um, not in the U.S., thankfully, unless there's some rural Appalachian telco that this is hanging out in, and in which case I feel sorry for the poor bastards that are hooked up to it. Um, you, I, I've still, I have been told there you can still find quite a few of, step, of stepping gear in third world countries, because after we took it all out, we shipped it overseas. Um, you know, Merry Christmas. Um, we, it, we traditionally screw other countries, and this is one of the winny ways. Yeah, and rather than upgrading to, uh, and rather than upgrading to some of the, the newer 5 BSS or well, I don't know what's even current these days. Well, five is still current. Five is still pretty current. They uh, go to, um, they just go to cellular switches instead, rather than pulling the extra copper and actually plunking down a couple of mil on a on a new uh, PGT infrastructure. They just drop in a cell switch instead, instead of just going off these things. Because the infrastructure is more fun too, especially you know, countries where you have no established rights of way, uh, things like that. You just you drop a cell tower, you know. Anyway, um, the, the, I, I wanted to point out that uh, one of the reasons that's actually pushing the schedule, the, the deployment schedule of the the electronic switches, there were um, you know number one ESS uh, is is hybrid mechanical electronic. It's electronically controlled but all the actual line switching is done by mechanisms not that dissimilar from this. And they, uh, they're hard to maintain. You know, you've got moving relays and, and lots of things. The contacts need cleaning, the relays need replacing a lot. And the people who know how to do that work are retiring. And when you have infrastructure you can no longer maintain, you need to replace it. And so, you know, that the last couple 1A ESSs in Ameritech territory were just replaced in the last year or three. They did um, that to uh, Waterford? Uh, oh yeah, Waterford, uh, a couple in Detroit, uh, Roseville. Um, you know, there were a lot of places still running on these, these old switches and the people are retiring. You know, they're, they're, they're taking the buyout or they're just dying or whatever, you know. And cadmium in the relay context, who knows. But. Um, so the, uh, the deployment schedule was, was kind of rushed because of that. And uh, it's, it's real interesting to watch them take out one of these old switches because everything now is in, you know, cabinets and it's all nice and, you know, you just wheel it off the truck, you roll it upstairs, you, you take the feet off, you bolt it to the floor. 
the old stuff could be in 23 inch frames or it could be in 40 something these wide frames or whatever and a lot of them were they were essentially built on site you know back in the 50s 60s 70s when they were installed and so you don't really want to cut those pieces apart when you take it out and ship it to Mexico or wherever it's going and so they're actually they're trying to take out like four frames in a row in one unit so they can just take the entire you know trunk selector frame and, and run it down to, to some other country trying to get that thing out of the side of the building is impressive <laughs> I sometimes have to cut a hole in the brick of the CO. Yeah, most COs that are multiple floors, if you look at a lot of the older central offices, you'll see doors that are just going nowhere. Oh, yeah, the door of the building. the side of the building. Uh, Royal Oak, Maine is a good example of this. You just look at the side of the building, and there's like a door four floors up. And there's no stairs, just a door. And they're actually used to, um, when they installed the equipment, they would bring a crane up and they'd open that door and they'd swing the equipment uh, from the crane into that door. Th there's no swing about it. Um, yeah, they, you, you they, don't want this hitting the side. You don't want a million dollar right. phone switching inside the side it, of the building. It's not like they were penduluming it. They were, yeah. they were they, they kind they of hang, like reaching they, for it. And yeah, they, they hang it there, yeah, like outside the door. And then they tell a couple of, of barely above minimum wage guys standing inside, like on the third floor of the CO, looking down, just reach out there and grab it and pull it in. <laughs> and and, and we'll, we'll let the lead out of the crane and let it set down as, as you pull it into the building. Um, Don't fuck up or you will die. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. But, yeah. uh, but the, the electronic equipment's a lot nicer. It's a lot lighter. <laughs> it's usually rack mountable. And it's, it's modular. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just you take out the heavy parts and you carry it up the stairs or whatever you have to do in a building with no elevator. You carry the other parts up the stairs, you put them back together. But the, the old mechanical stuff was not so kind. So it does last, as, as, as is apparent. Um, and you can see when it fails, because it arcs really nicely. <laughs> um, do you want to open up to questions here? Or? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The whole thing is questions. I was about to say, at this point, um, questions, phone information. Anybody anybody's ever been curious about and wanted to know? Can I ask a question about the public data site? Uh, I guess that would be fine, yes. Okay. Pass the mic over. Um, Have a mic. Maybe I apologize if it's like in the FAQ section or something on the side of the site. Uh huh. You know, when I put in an MPA and XX and I get this is the address, these are the exchanges. I mean, is that public and furthermore free information? That's an alert, isn't it? Um. Well, there is, they do sell it in LERG, but they also, for regulatory reasons, the Nas North American Numbering Plan Administrator, or NANPA, actually has to publish a certain amount of the data. Um, for accountability reasons and for competitive reasons. They have to publish that information. It is actually available for download on their site. Um, yes, for free. It's not as comprehensive as what I have. Um, it simply says this phone number goes to the switch. It's in this rate center. It's in Ameritech. Good luck. Um, and the actually the number pooling is publicly available but really awful. So you see the thousands block data in there, and it's there's actually a spider that crawls a uh, uh, web page that is run by a different part of NANPA, and uh, holy crap, is that some hairy stuff? It actually has to parse HTML your, simply your because is, your hand is reflecting audio onto the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, simply because they have to um, publish this information. It doesn't mean they have to do it in a machine uh, accessible way. And uh, I would tell you exactly how to do it, but it's really unkind, and I'm not wanting to encourage people to do it, because if too many people do do it, um, they'll probably use that as an excuse to stop giving the data away rather than put it in a machine-readable format. Um, that's how phone companies are. They think this data is private. They treat it as if it's proprietary. It's really not. These are your phone numbers. They're allocated. and. Uh, you know the the phone network is really a public resource. It was um, it was subsidized by government mandated monopolies for years, and uh, what you didn't pay them in um, in grants out of your tax dollars, you paid them as a forced monopoly. You didn't have a choice. Um, Canadian data is remarkably harder to come by simply because they still have monopolies in certain sense. For the most part, they do. 
for yeah for the most part and um, as such you can't even get switch data you can simply say this is a number in Alberta it, it is a uh, um, Bell mobility what about like telcos like Deutsche Telecom and Belgacom and all the you know, French Telecom I don't even remember what it's called what about all the government run telcos over here are they even more restricted um, you, they just you don't get that information period you can't it's like classified super they have no reason to give it out what I can say from, from knowing somebody actually over in Germany who's dealt with Deutsche Telekom, um, pretty much, and, and the, the generic term is, is PTT, is, is post telegraph and telephony. Usually it's a guy in most European, actually most countries other than the US, Canada, and I think maybe Mexico, though I can't say. It's, it, most of the stuff is still government monopoly. And they treat this stuff like it's, it's, it's uh, more than nuclear classified. Getting information out of them, getting them to even install a phone line is, is very, very difficult. Um, I remember in one instance he was saying, oh yeah, I just had three ISDN VRIs dropped in my office. I don't know what the numbers are. They just show, I ordered them, they showed up and installed them, and they won't give me my own phone numbers when I call them up. Because I can't validate that I'm a customer because I don't have my phone number. So if you could take, if you can, if you can imagine the worst government bureaucracies, um, like think about the IRS before, I don't know, I, one would say the reforms didn't happen, but think the worst of the IRS applied to your phone bill. Yeah, and the thing about BRI that makes this really suck is that generally your SPIDs are based on the, your actual phone numbers. So if you don't have that information, you can't connect the switch and turn the lines up in order to call someone and have them read it off their caller ID. A SPID, a SPID is a, um, God, I can't remember the actual acronym it stands for. Yep. Yeah, Service Profile Identifier. And basically, the, it's an internal numbering thing for the switch. You say, I am SPID so-and-so, and it goes, cool, well, I have this DID and this DID and this DID for you. I'm going to direct traffic your direction for these numbers now. Um, realistically, in the United States, for BRI, we tend to simply assume there's only one DN for, the num for each SPID. Um, there's no technical impediment for them to have, for you to not have 20 numbers assigned to your ISDN line, but they just simply won't in most cases. Or can't. Um, a lot of times they, they, they're <coughs> bringing stuff out and the switch does, can't even speak anything other than that because they didn't think anybody would ever want to do it even though it's in the spec. I found in many cases too uh, phone companies actually limit what they offer based on what their provisioning and billing systems are capable of billing. Mm -hmm. um, because there's no reason for example that you can't have the phone company do an IVR menu for you. E any of the um, computerized switches actually support the ability to play a recording and absorb a digit and route the call based on that. So they could be running a phone switch for you and just drop you five lines instead of one, one for each handset. But they don't because they have no way of billing it and no automated way of setting it up. Centrix is an interesting beast and it depends on, I, what I can say is it depends on the state. <coughs> Even if it's one theoretical lack if like SBC or now ATT. Um, depending on the state you order Centrex in, they all have different feature sets because of the tariffs and because they, as much as they claim they're all one phone company, you've actually got something like 50 different billing systems. Um, it's it, not uncommon. It also, it also depends on the switch. As far as doing things like, you know, assigning multiple DNs to a BRI and things like that, switches are notorious for implementing everything you could possibly imagine. Um, you know, the, the people who design the switches read the specs and say, well, this looks like fun. Uh, we'll build it in. It'll be buggy, um, and if nobody asks for bug fixes, it'll remain buggy, but it'll be in there. Um, but yeah, the billing systems are really what limits what they like to sell. Uh, as far as Centrexes goes, a lot of that can depend on the actual switch that's in the area. Um, my understanding, and I, I haven't done Centrex work, but my understanding is that it was, it was put forth by Lucent, um, or, or by AT&T or, or whatever they were calling themselves at the time um, when they when they took over the uh, the ESS manufacturing from Western Electric and said well let's let's add some features and get some brand name stuff out there and so they, they made this thing called Centrex and other people's switches couldn't do it and then you know the customers weren't happy with that so they had to, to kind of push that out but I think there might be some intellectual property encumbrances with some of those feature sets that are actually a switch maker proprietary. I, I can't say for certain. Well, I've, just, I, I've done a lot of uh, 
installations for you know some of my own you know, you know customers I've done computer consulting for. Now we have centers in one area where we live, and it was just like they you know call office to office. They just dial four. They don't have to dial the entire you know prefix to suffix at that point. And then you got to deny just like a feature set on a PBX would to, to get out. And with well, the, the amusing thing about the IVR thing I was mentioning, um, they could be charging people for more phone lines as a result of this. They could build it into their Centrix feature sets and add it as yet another thing they can charge you for. And say, oh, well, you need a phone line for every extension now instead of just one for your phone system. And they could be billing people. There are companies who will willingly pay um, for eight lines into their thing for all eight employees rather than have to worry about a phone system. Well, that's what it was originally sold as. It, it, the original concept, and I'm, I'm, I'm directing my brain as, as Nate was talking here, um, Centrix was also deployed because they were rolling out all these new switches at the time. They didn't want to roll out, because back in the day, when you ordered PBX, you had to order it from Westwood Electric through the bell, and they dropped it in and maintained it. Um, <coughs> they got really tired of this because as they started rolling out more PBXs, the maintenance costs went up, but they couldn't raise it due to tariff. So they came up with Centrix and ran it off the switch. Mm -hmm. um, you can do all, and, and as Nancy was saying, it was in, in all territories. Like in California, we can get an auto attendant, but you wouldn't believe what it costs. It costs us almost less to pay a secretary at the company I work for than it is for them to do um, custom voice response stuff. Um, or not voice response stuff, but custom um, auto attendant and auto answer stuff. In Tennessee, you can't get it. All you can get is a Centrix phone line again. Dial the, the four digits of the number, everything's assigned in a group, hit nine to get out. Um, the other thing I want to point out, phone companies love, well, while we're on the topic of Centrix, phone companies love to sell you Centrix um, because it costs more. Um, most PBXs these days, as long as you order ground start regular phone lines, you're fine. They're saying, oh no, if you're hooking up a PBX, you need a Centrix line. If your PBX has every feature set that the Centrix feature set's going to do, don't order it. Um, we found when we, we did a cleanup last year of all of our analog lines at all of our remote sites, the company I work for, we found that we were spending on average four, three times extra that we needed to spend because these lines have been sitting around for 10, 15 years. The person who originally ordered it didn't know any better. Wow. Converted them all to, to what they call 1NMB uh, or just a standard loop start or turn over the G for ground. Yeah. Um, ground start lines and most of our costs went away. We weren't using the Centrix feature sets. That's great. So, so I wonder, I wonder how many organizations out there in the same boat that could, you know, do this sort of a cleanup procedure, audit all the lines, and say, do we really need this? Um, that would hurt. <laughs> the telecos maybe my paycheck. But um, now I, I want to go back to the thing you said about the maintenance costs. When you have, uh, you know, somebody else locates a piece of equipment in your building, and then it's their job to maintain it, and it's your job to let them in. Um, that is the big pain, you know, it's like uh, getting on the roof of the hotel here to install the uh, uplink for the conference network took like hours of waiting for someone to materialize with the key to the roof um, because Jimmy Chan wasn't around. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I think about the first one. Yeah, it's, it's Sunday morning, but yeah, it is Sunday morning. Yeah, if you can't, if you if people watching the video can't tell, we were all up late last night. Um, anyway, um, lately I've been contracting for cell companies, and you know, 90% of the sites are out in a farmer's field somewhere, or behind a hardware store, in a little fenced compound, or whatever. They're really easy to get to. Um, that other 10% is an absolute pain, and takes you know as much time to get into as the other 90% put together, um, because you've got to you know call this guy three days in advance and have someone meet you at the site and then provide ID. And I'm a contractor, so I don't have ID, so I got to call a tech and have him meet me there. And then he shows up and he's like, all right, you're good, you're in, he leaves, and then I got to go get something or whatever, and you know, things screwed up, and I got to come back, and it's another three days wasted. Um, getting access to customer or, or landlord sites is a royal pain. And so anything you can possibly do if, if you're locating equipment somewhere else, anything you can possibly do to make it manage itself, make it maintain itself, is, is a bonus. And uh, these, you know, mechanical... So what if you do like an entire, an entire cell panel, an entire tower panel? You well, sit down for three days and tell somebody let you in. Uh, yeah. that's, that's why usually in the places where you've got the cells in buildings, 
they're sort of downtown or in an urban environment, and there are lots of other cells packed in really densely. They're not, they're not that dense because of uh, uh, their reach. They're that dense because of call volumes. And so you can lose one, and the neighbors will just fill in. Um, not very well. You know, obviously it was there for a reason. They, they're, they're expensive to run. Um, but you know, out in the country, if you lose one, you might actually have a, a big gap in coverage because nobody else's signal reached that area. Um, but usually downtown, when you're dealing with in-building uh, equipment, it's it's not that big of an issue. And they don't they don't fail all the way down very often. Yes. I have I actually wanted a question for uh, maybe Joe and Paul. Regarding when we talk about uh, PDX switches and how most PDX switches have capabilities of building contracts now. How would Asterisk compare to those? Um, Asterisk will basically, if you configure it right, Asterisk will beat most key systems functionality-wise. I'm highly suspecting, based on some of the literature that's hitting my desk for phone systems, um, that uh, a lot of them are probably running a lot of Asterisk code. Uh, Nortel just came up with the BCM50. It's a completely Linux-based uh, PDX. It's very, very little. It's on an ARM board. Um, I'm supposed to be getting one, but um, based on some of the feature sets that they've been talking about, I wouldn't be surprised if Nortel said, hey, let's go run up a bunch of asterisk code and just I've, create some I've of seen stuff. a couple of them, and the, and the management software, I swear to God, that the underlying code looks almost exactly like asterisk. Like they suck bits and pieces and, and I mean, changed it just enough to make it look like it's not it, and then came up with some proprietary crap. Out of fairness to some of them, there are only so many ways you can encode, uh, you know, PCM audio. Yeah. But um, yeah, you have to wonder sometimes whether they simply, uh, whether it was maybe it wasn't so much a conscious effort, but a lazy coder simply going, <laughs> somebody's already done my work for me. <laughs> well, and that's and that's exactly it. The other problem is is that like a lot of them are running Windows embedded OSs. Um, Nortel, for example, because it's a platform I know best. The BCM 200 and 400s are still running Windows NT 4.0. Um, some of you probably heard me rant about this. We have a nightmare every time securing these things. Um, and then all of a sudden we're finding out, and I actually kind of got confirmation last night um, indirectly, that they're going to be porting all of them over to Linux because they don't really want to keep going on the Windows on the Windows line, and these are effectively uh, PCs anyway. Um, a lot of key systems I've evaluated, a lot of, uh, what I mean key system for anybody who doesn't know, think dead stupid phone switch. Yeah, you pick it's it up. a dead stupid PBX. Yeah, a key system comes from you pick it up and you push the line key depending on, on what extension you want to ring or what line you want to use. They're, they're usually more intercom than they are phone switch. They usually have an outboard voicemail. Um, though that's, again, becoming increasingly uncommon because you take apart most key systems and most small PBXs and you will find PCs inside with interface cards. This sounds amazingly like an asterisk system. Um, so it, the, the merger is, it, it's going to be about equivalent if it isn't already. And the, the, the question would be, the, the question would be if you, if you get one of these things, you know, out of a dumpster somewhere, you tear it apart, you go to the drive and you say, gee, look at all these nice interface cards. Can I get the drivers, because this thing is based on Linux, can I get the drivers off of their OS and, you know, integrate this into my own asterisk uh, or whatever. That's the big question. There's so much interesting telco hardware out there, and it would be great to be able to use, you know, a line module from a, a DMS switch or something like that, just as a as a FXS card for your for your asterisk box. Yeah, yeah sure. I want to serve eleven thousand lines. Um, uh, you know, if you just had drivers for it, it would be great. Um, you need like a P4 for that. <laughs> no, but that's that's where a, a lot of their uh, a lot of their work is going and. I'm suspecting that they're they're kind of sticking with the proprietary hardware simply to prevent the cards in these these little uh, key systems and so on from walking off um, because the it's it's hard for people to, to get working. But as that changes, as they realize, you know, maybe it's not worth their while uh, to do the proprietary approach. As as more and more parts of the system get standard, we're going to see more and more of this really capable hardware on the market that you can just plug in and use. And, and that's going to make everybody's job a lot easier. And a lot of the things I'm seeing too lately are, you know, this the switch deals in trunk lines, and you bring out, say, like an ad tray and break it out into actual lines, mm -hmm. the larger stuff. So you know, not you're not even necessarily seeing copper going all the way back to it anymore. It's simply switching high cap circuits, which have breakout devices at the end of them. That's true. Yeah. 
And that's really the way it should be. Yeah, I agree. Couldn't you, like, I always thought it would be cool if you could, like, make your own personal tub, or you'd have, like, your, uh, all your actors boxes and any buckets and all banks, you go sub copper to sub home. Mm -hmm. Could you be just, like, Verizon and basically do this with asterisk yourself? You could. Um, the telephone company regulations prevent you from putting switching equipment in other people's central offices. So you would have to get a channel bank at their central office. You'd have to be, gain CLEC status. You would have to negotiate interconnect agreements. You'd have to pay to co-locate your uh, equipment there and then run T1s back to your switching center where so God help me hope you're not running just asterisk or at least more than one of them. Well, on top of that, for the love of God, <laughs> you'd also have to be running SS7 as well as part of the interconnect, which I believe is kind of an SS7 as of the last one. Yeah, there, there are projects for that. Yeah. And if everybody doesn't know, um, SS7 is basically how phones are just talk to each other between central offices. It's the mother of all signaling protocols. <laughs> there are parts of it that are used for simply saying um, trunk one, trunk one, uh, line four. There is a call coming in from this number. We're trying to get this number. Uh, can you complete the circuit? And it says yes. And then you, it starts ringing the end party, and it comes back saying, I'm ringing the end party. And then the call pi either picks up, or it comes back and says, uh, the user is busy. Or it will say, um, you know, the user has picked up, open a voice path, supervise. Just begins, begin billing. Um, and uh, there's also, where you get the, you'll notice at a certain point in time in the late 80s, the phone company started offering automatic callback, where it would just continuously call a number, and it would ring your phone when they were no longer busy. What would it do just kind of And what it actually does, every 30 seconds, it would try to open a voice path over SS7 to the other switch. And it would look and see if it got a busy response code. If it didn't, it would say, hold on a minute, ring you. And then it would say, OK, complete the call while yours is ringing, and hope that you would pick up around the same time. But, but if, yeah, as Paul's saying, don't, dear God, don't do this with asterisk, though for all I know, there's probably some c like out there that is doing this. Right. Um, you have to, if, if you're running that kind of interconnect, you're running that kind of truck, you have to stay up 24-7. Going down is not an option. You can actually get failover for asterisk. I mean, well, I mean that's the thing. You'd have to set up multiple redundant asterisk right. systems it's, it's and not trust. It's asterisk that we have the problem with. It's that you, if you drop an SS7, like you can actually affect the phone system in a negative way because the other thing that exists not only is it trying to open signaling paths and there are timeouts. So you know they're just squirting over the path. Hey, can I get a path? Can I get a path? Can I get a path? And they're waiting for you to reply. Um, and it's possible if you receive a high call volume to um, cause really bad things to happen at the other end of that SS7 link if you don't answer. Uh, the other thing that you'll find too is that it's also used for something called TCAP, which is database lookups. So where you try and look up, say, um, I need the caller ID data for this user, or is, does this user have collect call block? Does this user, can I third party bill this user? Um, you know, so or even local, uh, local number, num number portability is another one. Is Do you actually have this phone number? Because I think you do, or does somebody else actually have this? And I need to complete the call in another direction. Um, what I was going to say, though, about Asterisk in terms of being your own phone company. Um, right now, we're looking at Asterisk to do some tenant stuff, because we have tenants in our office building. So if they're bringing their own lines in on your PRIs or on analog fronts or whatever, then you know you can use it. There's somebody talking to me last night. I didn't catch her name about sub billing with asterisk to your tenants off the lines that are coming, your DIDs that are coming into your your office. So you're not exactly being a CLEC. You're just kind of providing services to your tenants. So that is one niche use of people, third parties outside of yourself being used in an application like that. So we're potentially looking at instead of adding a third cabinet to our option 61 Nortel, which is not a small space investment. Um, doing a bunch of additions <coughs> using Asterisk and some of the sub building software um, that's out there to to provide those services. Okay, as far as uh, as far as being your own telco, I want to go back to that idea. Rather than going the official route and putting equipment in the central offices and negotiating with the phone companies and, and doing that, you know, you can take the total guerrilla approach and just say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna all run our own equipment and do our own links and kind of run independent of it. And uh, you should go to personaltelco.net. 
and there's a there's an interesting project. It's it's kind of like it. I learned about it in the same time period where I learned about Seattle Wireless, and so a very similar sort of idea. People are, are trying to create their own infrastructure using the unlicensed radio spectrum. And, and yeah, they're they're doing all sorts of things. Um, I haven't been to their site in a very long time. I don't know what they're up to lately, but I'm gonna go find out. You know, Nate, I do have one one bitch about uh, if you're in the cell industry. Oh, what please. Is up, what what is up with you know? It's like you, you can't get a cell phone anymore that's got any decent. I mean, the compression and the vocoders are using absolutely blows. Uh, I mean, I've literally had guys use Skype on their you know their, their, their cell phones and get a better sounding connection. Sure. Standard, you know, voice because the, the, the vocoder issue is is channel capacity. They they simply they don't have the spectrum. They don't have the tower density. They need to handle the call volumes. Um, I mean, analog even sounded better. Oh yeah, analog sounded better, and, and it would hold like twenty calls per cell, you know, or something something ridiculously low like that. Well, you get an eight to one, you know, vocoder, a twelve to one vocoder. You're you're looking at a lot more, you know, customer billable minutes per tower. People really loathe busy signals, and or or you know, system not available retry later, um, and you know they, they do anything they can to avoid that. What they should be doing is putting up more smaller towers so they, they have the density. The, the the deal here for anyone who, who hasn't done a lot of cellular uh, research or reading is is called geographic frequency reuse or spatial frequency reuse. The very first. Um, the very first mobile phone systems, you had like one site in the middle of town and, and your mobile unit bolted to your trunk was blasting out 50 watts. And, and they had you know, a certain, like, let's say, a handful of channels they could use. And so that meant you had a handful of, of phone calls that could be in progress in the entire metropolitan area. A handful minus one, there's a signaling channel. Yeah, and the, the signaling <laughs> channel actually. the entire channel for signaling? Yeah. Yep. The, the signaling channel is, was also known as a calling channel because someone would actually pick up like the microphone and say, you know, unit three, you have a call. Um, well, and, and on top of that, you, you also keep in mind that this is, these were more like land mobile radios with phone patches. Exactly. And, and it was possible they, to hear other people's calls. And, and so then the, the cellular system. Well, these yeah. were transistor units that were mounted with trucks. The, the, the big deal with cellular was that now we've got all these little base station sites all around the area. And somebody who's on this cell is taking up this radio channel. And so for the couple neighboring cells, that radio channel's got somebody on it. But when you get to the other side of town, you can have another call on that same radio channel. And you've got geographic frequency reduce. And, and the denser you can pack these cells, the less power you can run, the smaller space you, you splatter that channel over, the more total concurrent calls you can have in the same amount of spectrum. So instead of putting up a constant 2 and 300 foot tower, why don't they just go off like the white house concept and only have like 60 foot towers? Not in my backyard. Five or ten. Talk, talk to your homeowners association, talk to your local city government and say, my cell phone quality sucks because my company has to run a, a 37 to 1 vocoder and it's because they don't have the ability to put as many towers as they need up. And that's, that's simply where it is. Well, I, I, don't, I don't mean to defend the industry, but that's its business. Well, and at the same time, it depends on where in the industry, because one thing that's happened, at least in the Detroit area, um, you'll be driving around and see a great pot on top of a telephone pole, because the telephone pole's already there. Um, I know next time... the white pads on the... Uh, other side, on the way to shape like that's ricochet. Um, <laughs> don't even go there. We're, we're down to five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, they are starting to do that in areas that geographically make sense, because I've seen these. I haven't been able to identify all of them, because they're usually in beige NEMA enclosures with no identifying stickers. Darn it. Mm -hmm. um, they're connected via either T1 or Fiber. Um, I have seen one some with Nextel stickers on them, but they're using the existing infrastructure. Um, and again, I can't. I don't know all the carriers that are doing this. Mm -hmm. I only saw one Nextel sticker on one box. And I, it may have been there by accident. We need, um, we need pictures. I, I, well, had I known I was doing this, I might have gotten pictures. Um, but they are starting to do that. They are starting to do the microcellular level on existing phone infrastructure. Um, the Teslas are pulling an immense amount of fiber. These are 72 strand cables. They're not using all of them. They will. They, you can buy down fiber from the telcos. They're just not really advertising it yet. I'm and there is, there's multiple wavelengths per fiber, so you can have several colors on all 72 strands. So if you're driving around and you start seeing things, if you start seeing little gray pods or even um, their white antennas with big beige boxes underneath them, those are cell sites. And I'm starting to see a lot more of those now. Th that's a fairly. That's like within the last six months, though. Yeah, I've seen a couple. 
Um, there's, there's a website you should check out. I think it's called wirelessadvisor.com. They have a, a section of their forums called the Tower Hunting Team. And they do, they, they love the cell phones that are disguised as trees and clock towers and stuff. But in general, they just, they collect pictures of different types of cellular equipment. And so if, if you start seeing these things out there and you don't know what they are, take a picture, post it up on Tower Hunting Team with as much data as you can gather, and let the people comment, because there's some, there's some really knowledgeable people on those forums. Right. really like the West Bloomfield tactic where they had the 200-foot tall T-Mobile pine tree. No, it's sprint. Oh, it's, it's it, T-Mobile's not it. Oh, that's right there. Um, yeah, basically, the city of West Bloomfield, said, uh, Michigan said, you can't build a cell tower that, that's, that's that high. You have to disguise it. So they put pine, large transparent fake pine branches around a, was it a 200-foot tower? <laughs> it's a 200-foot tower. It sticks out like a sequoia, which, by the way, don't grow in Michigan for anybody who's not from Michigan. Um, and so it's even more obvious than anything else. Trees, 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 tower, trees, trees, trees. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we got one, five minutes? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, well, you do have five minutes now, but okay. uh, he, said, he has a question, though. I just wanted to say that uh, my family has a lemon field, and next to it there's a walnut field that was recently cleared out, and within two days or so it seemed, a huge palm tree sprouted up. This is Southern California, and it's perfectly straight, and then it has leaves at the top, and it's a cell site. And we were like, no. we didn't see that two days ago. Uh, <laughs> sudden pine tree growth for the yeah. people in the video. Uh, somebody the palm tree, tree rather. Right. Somebody, yeah. missed a, somebody missed a zoning meeting. We've <laughs> <laughs> got one of those pine trees in Basque Ridge, New Jersey, too, right off 287. Take, take pictures. There, there are thousands of these things out there. Um, Andrew and a couple of other companies make these disguises. It's like Andrew has been making microwave equipment and antennas and towers for decades. And, and now they're making pine needles um, and, and things like that because yeah, they, what the companies are buying. Um, there are so many varieties of these disguised uh, towers, it's hilarious. Yeah, the biggest oh, problem oh. everything has is not in my backyard. No one ever wants this stuff to be in their neighborhood, but they want their cell phone to work perfectly. I have always said, well, with Wi-Fi, they're their own worst enemy. It's like, oh, you know, especially in rural areas, you know, people come to me all the time, how come I can't get cable DSL? I'm like, well, we can put a 200 foot tower up there. Oh, I don't want that in my backyard. Well, how bad do you want service? Yeah, too bad. <laughs> you know, that's how like, you're your own damn worst enemy. What do you want here? Deal, deal. You know, I like the rich, pay, the rich towns who can afford to make like a wireless infrastructure. They're all like, well, I don't want these unsightly boxes hanging off my uh, light poles. There's no way. The, those look like shoe boxes. They're awful. And it's like, well, fine. Don't have wireless on your city. What, what, what gets me is that, you know, back when all these, these electric utility poles were put up, nobody cared. And we've, we've gotten so used to them, we don't even see them. And, you know, some neighborhoods are putting their utilities on the ground, but most of the time you drive down the road, there's this huge forest of wires. And then people are like, one more tower. Oh, no, we can't have one more tower. Yeah, you get used to it. The towers are pretty big with that kind of light absorbing gray paint. No matter what the sky color, they can yeah, the kind of sky bluish. Yeah, you can you can do that. It doesn't work that well. Or maybe it's just me. I, I see towers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. We say because we were apparently time short. Does anybody got one more question? Or? Yeah, you guys still have like three minutes. So oh, okay. Two short questions or a long one. What about cell phones? Well, what about caller ID and why 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 the hell that? Caller ID with name does not come with cell phones for some odd reason. Why is there an interoperability that there's, you're aware there's of? no capability in the uh, protocol for them to send a name and where there is the phones themselves or the switches don't interact. Is that due to regulatory or no. just when when, the, when the cell phone protocols were written, nobody wanted caller ID with name on their phones. Yeah. When they were originally written, no one wanted caller ID, then they found a way to send caller ID. Um, I, I think in the analog spec there may actually be a color ID with name set that you can do, but nobody ever supported it. Um, and just like you know, the second NAM, there, there's just so many things that weren't just like any other telco thing. There's so many features that they don't actually support because uh, they either didn't know we're there, or um, they can't convince management that this is a good idea. Or yes, there's build a box to stuff into the data stream. 
Um, uh, pester, pester your provider. That'll that'll get that box built. Yeah, it'll it ultimately comes down to also what flash they're gonna put on the phone, what what infrastructure they're gonna do. I mean, if you ever really want an interesting read, go download the GSM spec sometime. It's about this thick if you print it, or even more. If, if you, you go through that, and there are so many features in the GSM protocol that do not ever get implemented. Because nobody ever thinks to, or there's no capability to, or they're like, why would anybody ever want that? Um, and what they end up usually doing is just abusing SMS. <laughs> yeah, and th there was some carriers to, to this day use SMS to in indicate you have new voicemail. Um, simply because they didn't implement uh, message waiting in GSM. Yeah, it, uh, up until recently, T-Mobile was doing that. Um, thankfully, they stopped. I like having a voicemail indicator now. <laughs> um, the other thing is, is that I'm actually seeing stuff going in this direction. Um, I ported my number to Sprint not too long ago and found that suddenly I have an outbound call ID with name, mm -hmm. which means the they are doing that that they, they are actually. interconnecting with the CNAM databases now. So great. You know, as they do this, they will gain the technical ability to look up names and provide them to you. Um, maybe the next set of phones will do that. Well, and actually, from the other rumors is when they go to the new CDMA, was it CDMA 2000 at this point? No. WCDMA. WCDMA, probably. Yeah. WCDMA, uh, or the next gen EVDO um, data services, they can start doing QoS, uh, quality of service. Uh, supposedly, um, some of the new voice traffic is going to be carried voice over IP style on private subnets. Uh, Sprint is Sprint's notorious moving. for wanting to do this, and so you may get those um, features. Yeah. So what were you say? I was I was going to say a lot of this uh, the move to voice over IP over cellular data uh, is actually driven by intellectual property problems where you know there are patents on like push to talk which I didn't know you could patent. It's like the way radios have worked since Marconi's day, but um, you know, whatever. Whatever. If you do it over yeah, IP, if you do it over IP, it's not under somebody's patent. So uh, we're out of time. Yeah, I think we're out of time here, so. Uh, thanks for being such a great audience. <laughs>